and this is a crossword puzzle, and it yes. was sitting on your desk. So you were doing a crossword puzzle on your desk? Don't no. you can't lie in front of the camera. You can't lie. Then yes, I was. Okay. What are you stuck on? <laughs> What's the word? To give us the I thing. I can't. Well, no, just tell us which one it is. If I say it and then, you know, this ends up on the thing, then people are going to think I'm stupid for not knowing it, so I just don't want to okay. say it. Okay, a three-letter word for vehicle that starts with C is car. <laughs> Where's Kramer? He just went downstairs. He went downstairs? Yeah. I'm looking for non-essential personnel. My guess is when someone's not at their desk, they're probably non-essential. Would you agree? Uh, I guess so, yeah. You just sold out the guy you sit next to in a cubicle. <laughs> The choice to remain hydrated doesn't imply that I have no work to do. How much of this water do you drink a day? 78 ounces. What are you, a weeping willow? Are you, are you a tree? That's a ton of water. How much of this day are you urinating then? How many times do you go to the bathroom during the day? Ideally once an hour. You urinate once an hour? Um, Why ideally once an hour? Well, I have to make sure my urine is almost clear. You drink 78 ounces of water a day. I drink you, more than 78 ounces of water a day. I drink 78 ounces of water while I'm here. How much water are you drinking a day? Double uh, that. Double 78? Correct. You drink 160 some odd ounces of water a day. 156. Do you have friends and stuff? I do. Do you really have friends? I've never seen you with anybody. Do you really, be, be honest with me. Do you have friends? Yes. Name one quick. First name. You. party yes you want to have a bachelor party look in the camera and say you're excited to have a bachelor party i've been told to say i'm excited <laughs> joe joe oh they run away jordan why yeah. do they not wish to be viewed by us maybe they're shy they don't need to be on television to self-validate I think they were from the 40s and they had them as decoration throughout the restaurant i love those kind of old machines so i spent half the meal looking at those yeah. It was a magical night. If you choose what the hell was that? <laughs> why, why did, why did concentrate you on the amount of transportation time necessary, I'm sorry that but why did you go? Yeah, the memory just, of the meal. Just, why did you just you go? Understand? It was so dismissive. They probably snuck into the room to see I, what the... I, I sneaked into the room. Snuck isn't a word, Conan. And you went to Harvard and you should know that. <laughs> snuck. Past and past part of sneak. So I thought it would be fun for us to force Jordan to dress up as Spock and make him come out here and pay homage, homage to Star Trek and congratulate all Trekkies on their 50th anniversary. He doesn't want to do it. We're making him do it because it's his f***ing job. Please welcome Jordan Slansky. Jordan, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, now, first of all, tell us, why do you think Star Wars is superior to Star Trek? Well, Star Trek is grounded in our own frame of reference and as such suffers from the limits of our own trike reality. In fact, Star Wars delves more into the worlds of fantasy and mythology and touches on some universal mythological themes that have been present across humanity since the beginning of time. You'll find that most cultures on Earth share a common mythology. In fact, uh, the Greek Odysseus was known as Ulysses in Rome. Uh, the Greek Zeus was known as Jupiter in Rome. The Greek Poseidon was known as Neptune in Rome. And you're talking about a story of a young farm boy from the middle of nowhere that goes up against a great oppressor. And this story is common in a lot of mythology, such as Davy and Goliath. And you'll find, again, that this touches a core human emotion that we all need to explore through a fantasy world those concepts which we cannot achieve in our own reality world. Now, on another note, I find that the uh, universal worldwide acceptance of Star Wars is also grounded in this commonality that we all share. Instead of being limited through one frame of reference, through one focal point, we can see things in a cross-cultural manner, if you will. And in fact, to expand on that a little bit, I think that uh, you'll find that uh, the 
Star Wars universe is relatable for any culture on Earth, any economic standing, any financial standing on Earth. Because again, we're talking about themes that are core to the concept of humanity in general and emotional. Furthermore, I can tell you that the types of themes that you're talking about in Star Trek are limited towards a certain set of circumstances that exist in almost a two-dimensional plane, where in Star Wars you're really exploring different feelings about humanity, uh, happiness, sadness, all the uh, various spectrum of the human existence. And I find that even though you're talking about characters that are often not human, we as human beings can identify through their struggles. And you'll find that most great storytelling has to deal with a protagonist, an ordinary person up against extraordinary odds. And I think that if you look at the literature across the history of recorded time, you'll find that a lot of the great stories have followed that same theme. The storyline is almost unimportant because you're talking about grand themes here about human achievement when faced with unlikely odds. And furthermore, I can tell you that uh, beyond that, it's something that we can all agree upon. It is all uh, something that we can all identify with. And relatability, I'm sure you know, as uh, someone that works in the storytelling world, is a concept that uh, is necessary to have an audience invest themselves in the story that you're telling. Um, I'll also tell you that the uh, Star Wars universe, while on some level is very exotic, had uh, a musical soundtrack grounded in 19th century romantic music. And in fact, I can relate Star Wars, the appeal of it, towards some of the great Impressionist paintings like the uh, Dutch Van Gogh, because uh, his paintings, although not uh, photographic, if you will, or photorealistic, uh, inspired our own imagination to latch on to the concepts present in the painting. And for example, if you look at uh, Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night, you'll see that, uh, again, while it doesn't necessarily look exactly like a city and stars and the wind blowing through the trees, you can feel the feeling of what it was like to be in that situation. You know, unlike looking at a photograph, which again, gives you that two-dimensional representation, a split second, microsecond in time, if we will. And, and, and as anyone knows that's had a bad photograph taken them a split second in time, doesn't often represent the whole picture. However, when, uh, when you're talking about the idea of a painting, and certainly an oil painting, an impressionist oil painting, you're not necessarily capturing all the minute details, you're capturing a feeling. Now, how do you put a feeling down on canvas? How do you put a feeling down on the screen? Well, that's the job of the artistic storyteller. And in fact, uh, the storyteller in this case took his own human emotions, his own human struggles, and that of others, and put them into a fantastic circumstance, which none of us could have possibly experienced, yet can all take pride and relate to, again, the young struggling farm boy wanting to be a part of it. Now, these are themes that were touched upon in 1976's Rocky. I'm talking about the original Rocky. It wasn't about winning the fight. That movie is not a boxing movie. That movie is about an ordinary guy <laughs> placed in extraordinary circumstances. A guy, he was the underdog. You know, another common concept you find in a lot of literature. He was the underdog that wanted to make it. All he wanted to do was go the distance. He wanted to make it to the Philadelphia spectrum. Uh, it probably has some corporate branded name now. But at the time, 1976, shot in 1975, it was called the Philadelphia Spectrum. These theaters and arenas, amphitheaters, had real names back then. Uh, you know, I think Fenway Park is still named as such. Candlestick Park, I'm sure, has been renamed. I don't really follow sports myself, but I've heard these terms said. And I know that a lot of the uh, original, like Shea Stadium, I think is like Citibank Field or something. But <clears throat> that's not really relevant to what I'm talking about here. But uh, interesting nevertheless. Uh, however, um, what I'm saying is that uh, for an artist to accurately portray a feeling on film or a canvas or whatever the medium, I mean, you could be talking about a mound of clay. Really, the artistic medium is irrelevant when a singer gets up and sings. You don't care about the vocal cords vibrating at certain frequencies. You're trying to take part in and relate to a certain feeling that that artist is trying to convey. When a sculptor takes a look at a hunk of mud and clears away certain sections to make this great monolith of art, again, it's not about the uh, minerals that are present in the mud, it's about the feeling that you're trying to convey. You're fired. <laughs> Get the f*** out of here and never come back. I thought you were going to cut me off at some hand, so I just... No, no, it doesn't say I cut him off. Yeah, no. <laughs> it doesn't say I cut him off. We wanted, to, we wanted you to take your own cue. First of all, that was an incredible performance. It really was. I, I, I was waiting for you to finish so that I could say my line and didn't know. I thought that that was part of the, what they had in mind was that he goes on for six minutes. I didn't know.